have a question now, please. Babette, are you ready? Okay. Are you? Yes, I know how ready as ready as you'll ever be. <laughs> this is so comfortable. I was hoping you have some wonderful bergere for us to recline in here. Mm -hmm. I can't even see this favor, that's how bright these lights are. The first question I'm going to ask you is how do you uh, define a museum of design? And then we'll go into it. So, you know, give shorter answers because I'll ask all the obvious questions that you know about. Yes? Okay. Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is the person most centrally involved in making possible New, New York's newest delight to be born again. I'm referring to the Cooper Hewitt Museum, the National Museum of Design, on New York's Fifth Avenue and East 91st Street. And our guest is its remarkable director, Lisa Taylor. Thank you for having us here. I spoke to a cultivated, receptive person the other day, told him that we were coming to visit this museum, and he said, tell me, how do you define a museum of design? Oh, I thought he was going to say, don't ask Lisa what a museum <laughs> of design is. She says it's everything made by God and man. But uh, we do restrict it here to architecture, city planning, and industrial. Excuse me a moment. Go on. Can you hear me now? Can you wait for a moment, Babette, please? Yeah. Um. Uh, I think I answered the first part. The uh, museum collects architecture, city planning, industrial design, advertising design, interior design, fashion, home furnishings, all of the things that you see here, textiles, wallpaper, furniture, ceramic, glass, metalwork, jewelry, on and on. Actually, the museum was never really closed. It was just in a state of transition. Can you tell us what the origin and the evolution of the museum is? The Cooper Hewitt is really the earliest conceived museum in New York. Uh, it was conceived by Peter Cooper, who planned to put it in the Cooper Union when he built it, the Union in, in um, 1859. But um, the expenses in building the school were so great that he could never afford to collect anything, so it took um, about 30 years more for his granddaughters to take up the cause and to start the collection and it was officially opened as a museum in 1897. And what happened to it from 1897 till the 1960s? Well it was used almost primarily by students and designers. And it did not close? No, it never closed. Don't believe a word you read in the New York Times. <laughs> they said some very kind things about oh, this museum. Well, we'll believe that. But they also said we closed 13 years ago. And I think well, what they, happened in that 13-year period? Well, in 1963, Cooper Union felt they could no longer afford to keep the museum. And uh, it was going to sell the collection to the Metropolitan and then um, sell smaller collections to other museums and a committee was formed to save the museum. And um, uh, they really didn't know what to do with it because you couldn't give the collection to a private group of people. So the American Association of Museums uh, was asked to do a study and it was felt this was a very great collection that should be preserved for the nation. And uh, the Smithsonian was approached in the Oh, sort of mid Why did we have to go to Washington rather than in a New York museum? Wasn't there a talk of some association with the Metropolitan at one point? Yes. Um, well, the, they, it was going to be sold to the Met, but you see the collections would have been split. 
And it's very important to keep this collection together because uh, things in one department relate to things in another department. And it would have lost its usefulness. And uh, just as it would have if it had gone to the Smithsonian in Washington, our Winslow Homers would have gone to the National Collection, the prints and drawings, to another collection and textiles somewhere else. Is this the first museum that is part of the Smithsonian Institution that is outside of Washington? Yes, and it's the only private one, too. And you are the only woman director as well. Yes. <laughs> we have a lot of firsts here. <laughs> what is the nature of the collection specifically? You mentioned Winslow Homers and architectural drawings. Give us some idea in terms of numbers. Bragg. We have the largest collection of drawings in America, I'm happy to say, the largest collection of wallpapers in the world. Um, probably one of the finest um, collections of textiles there is, and um, picture archive of about a million and a half, which has grown or more than doubled just since we've been here. And um, we're strong in glass in other categories were probably weakest in furniture because we had so little space on 7th Street. Well, here we are sitting in a neo-Georgian mansion that has just been recycled as a museum. Perhaps you'd like to describe the building, tell us how you happen to be located here, and I think it's rather interesting that you neither tried to preserve the building intact nor altered it so radically as to lose its good qualities, such as they are. Will you tell us something about the building? Certainly. I should say it isn't finished yet. Uh, you may have noticed that it looks very dirty on the outside, and we're waiting for the wisteria to die, and we're going to start cleaning it sometime, is it November already? This yes. month. And um, we still have contractors in the basement and on the third and fourth floors. When we finished, it will have cost us twice as much to renovate as it cost to build the building in 1901. And that was a million and a half dollars? That was a million and a half then. What would it have cost? Have you ever made any comparison, if you were to build a museum from scratch now, of this uh, square footage? How does it compare to the cost of recycling this building? I don't think I should answer. You told me once that you... I was hoping that it was nice. Everyone <laughs> to encourage people to save landmarks. And it might well, then let's cheaper. not press that point. <laughs> um, can you tell us anything about the building? I know that it is a Bab Cook and Willard building, and I know, too, that Hugh Hardy, the architect responsible for the recycling, doesn't think that it really is a great artistic piece, but felt it had merit in being restored. Can you tell us why he believes that? Well, I think that's obvious when you look at it. it, it it's a very strong building, not a very beautiful building. Um, its strength is in the engineering, and um, I'm sorry you can't see the basement. Uh, we will open it to the public when it's finished, but it looks like the inside of a steamship. And that's where Carnegie's interests were. <laughs> but uh, the first and second floor of this building have basically been restored. Some of the rooms are hidden by the exhibition, but underneath certain um, fabric coverings, the original room remains. And um, what, uh, in the upper floors, um, we have pretty much um, opened up areas. There were servants' rooms, and then um, Columbia University was here for a number of years, uh, the school of using work. that as, as office space. And so the upper two floors have changed very much, except for the central hallway, which um, we have on every floor in which we've kept in. There are several firsts in the building, too, architecturally. I think it is the elevator. Is it the first passenger elevator in a uh, private uh, dwelling? In, in a city? private dwelling, yes. And um, the first air conditioning system. Well, how uh, was there air conditioning in 1901? Well, it was uh, filtering air through wet cheesecloth, and then somehow it, it worked. <laughs> and we were able to save a fortune by using the old ductwork. But, uh, most of the expenses in renovating the, the building were simply to meet modern building codes. We had to add a new fire stair back here and a new elevator, and then to have uh, humidity control for the collections. Uh, Hugh Hardy has said that it is not uh, a true piece of history, but it is a good reflection of the robber baron era. Now the question is, is this a good solution? 
Is this building adequate, do you think, for the kind of large-scale <coughs> exhibitions that you will have to mount here? We've already outgrounded, and, uh, and we haven't moved in. But we have another building around the corner, which was going to be our phase two, year 2000, and it's going to have to start as soon as we finish. Why don't you in. explain this plot of land, that here we are sitting in the Carnegie Mansion, and the other thing I think that is so interesting about it is the gardens that extend from the building and around the corner, the Miller House. Will you tell us the relationship between the Miller House and the Carnegie Mansion and what you plan to use that space for? Somehow this building was too small for the Carnegies and when their daughter married, um, they acquired a house around the corner, and which is where our offices are now and which will eventually uh, be where our public and exhibitions will be housed. Eventually, the entire collection will be in this building. That's the permanent collection. Oh, permanent collection, and the other building will house a theater underground. You see, right now, this is our largest space. It's not a very good place to receive company. We're um, pleased to be here. <laughs> you mentioned the permanent collection, which brings to mind the opening exhibition. Um, you said that the show will be a bridge and I'm quoting you, between the real world people live in and the largely very precious world in our collection. What did you mean by that? Well, we have um, much like this in our collection. What's the date of this wallpaper screen behind us? 1814. It's a very early French one, and the scene is the um, French in Egypt. It's woodblock. Well, the name of the exhibition is called uh, Man Transforms. Yes, and I've been getting a lot of flack about that. Why? <laughs> well, uh, we've been telling visitors' comments, and uh, man transforms. What about women? <laughs> Perhaps you should do a show called Woman Transforms. Woman it, Transformed. And then another. It's outrageous that the word man is used instead of person, people, or whatever. You are very unenlightened. <laughs> I didn't choose the title, and I was against it. But you did choose, in fact, in a rather bold stroke, to have as an opening show a show that reflects the fact that man-made design transforms every aspect of human life. And your exhibit aims to demonstrate that. It has generated a great deal of attention and no little amount of controversy, too. So in one way or the other, no one who sees it leaves untouched. I would like you first to describe the show and then to tell us why you didn't take the safe and predictable route of showing from the museum's incomparable collection as an opening show. Oh, if we had opened with our collection, everyone would have said that nice museum opened with that nice show and nobody would have come back again. No, actually. Um, but you're very admiring of the collection. Oh, we love the collection. But you see, it's the collection that the public really never knew, and uh, we wanted to draw on a new and much larger public. Uh, we could not show our three-dimensional items, which would have been very popular, uh, because they're in other museums for safekeeping and um, also exhibition and um, summer in warehouses. And uh, we felt that we couldn't just have three floors of drawings or three floors of wallpaper. It was if Cooper Hewitt used to be referred to, I think, as New York's best kept secret. So I assume that you took as part of your task an attempt to redefine this museum, mm -hmm. at least in the mind of the public. Mm -hmm. How did you arrive at an international show as well? Oh, I had a choice really of selecting anyone and uh, the person I selected just happened to live elsewhere. Do you want to tell us about him um, and what the show is about? Well, it's experiential. I shouldn't talk about it. But it shows very, very ordinary things. Breads. Um, seems perhaps very peculiar to go to a museum and see loaves of bread. But um, that's part of the design process that everybody is involved in, not, not just the baker, but the homemaker as well. And um, we show very old things next to new things. We show very precious things next to very ordinary things and uh, to show that they're really all a part of the design process. And if you understand certain basic principles, 
that underlie them, you can understand the entire collection. It doesn't really matter what period something is made in or what uh, decoration you use, that there are certain eternal values. Well, there are some people here who have not yet seen the show, and there are some people listening that have not yet seen the show. Perhaps you would describe some aspects of it. For example, the piece of cloth. Yeah, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, we have a very great um, textile collection. And uh, in order to make the public w more aware of cloth, um, Holine chose to do a room called Metamorphosis of a Piece of Cloth. And he does hundreds of different things to the cloth. You put it on one pole, it's a flag. You put it on two poles, it's a sail. On three poles, it's a tent, and, and so on. And he's the um, f uh, cloth that becomes the flag, for instance, has a, a, a variety of flags that have very different meanings. And um, that section ends with a film of cloth as a language and someone sending a message um, by semaphore. And um, well, he's trying to suggest that it's more important in the scheme of design than the wheel. It's the first thing we put around us when we're born and the last thing when we die. And to show that, there's a mummy of a crocodile mm -hmm. and clothing and uh, uh, cloth used for a thousand, uh, not a thousand, a hundred different purposes, um, a bandana, a bandage, uh, oh, everything. And then uh, there's a sculptured hand with the cloth wiping the window <laughs> to add a little humor. It's also been described as a learning to see show. How does that relate to the section, for example, on handles? Oh, I think it, it's it, part of every room, really. And I think the one that might be very obvious is the one right um, to your right, uh, which is a little planetarium uh, based on the theme of star. Now, a star in the sky is just a light beam, and man has translated that into many different forms throughout time and in different cultures. And uh, we've attached meaning to it. Um, you have an, an entirely different feeling if you see a, a Mercedes-Benz star or a Star of David or a Sheriff star. and. Uh, it's been wonderful for the staff as we've been looking for stars. We've been noticing them everywhere. And I even noticed after having these glasses for six years that I have stars right here. <laughs> and, but in each exhibit, there are just hints. And we want the visitor to take it um, on. And I think if you suddenly look at a 200 stars, when you walk out, you'll notice that the manhole cover has a star. And, that the hubcap of a, c a car has a star and you keep adding to it. And uh, the idea was that you would bring something of yourself here and take something away and keep adding to it and you can do that with any number of forms. And it's lots of fun. That occurs really in the room with the doors. Perhaps you can explain that too. The concept of the doors. Oh, there are endless handles and, and only one if you have to select the right one to open the door, and I've never been patient enough to do it myself. It's hard to believe after living through what you have here, which brings us to the question of the funding of this museum. You mentioned earlier that uh, this was the only private museum in the Smithsonian's collection. And I think this is a good time for us to stop so that he can turn over the cassette that's the and commercial. You, <laughs> yes, it's your commercial time. Yes. Talking about the funding for the museum, before this museum was opened, more than six and a half million dollars was raised by Lisa Taylor. How did you do that? Well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting easier, though. You know, uh, it's amazing. I've, I've been getting money from strangers who have read about us in the newspaper saying, thank you for what you've done for New York. Where did that money come from? Where did uh, the building come anybody from? Anybody who would give it to me. Most people now run when they see me, as you know. <laughs> 
Where did the building come the, from? The um, property, which is worth $10 million, was a gift from the Carnegie Corporation. And um, the money was raised from private individuals, foundations, and corporations to some extent. When you started raising the money, you really had no building. I assume your task was more difficult then. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, this property was only leased and we couldn't raise any money at all uh, not owning it and um, so we went back to the Carnegie Corporation that was leased um, to us by the Carnegie Corporation asking what they could do to help us thinking that they might give the first hundred thousand or half a million hopefully they that? gave us the whole thing I mean the, the whole property You mentioned that the museum was private who supports it now that you've used up all those millions to open the museum? How, where does the ongoing support come from? Well, I should say, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, I have to explain that whole background, is really a private institution. Uh, but it receives government subsidies from federal government, the way the Metropolitan and the Natural History Museum and the Brooklyn Museum and so on, receive money from city government. Except that is only a part of the local museum's budget, while it is the total. Uh, it, it isn't. Um, well, where else does their money come from? Oh, they have endowments. And, um, but pretty close and to the for, total. Because I assume right, that one right. of the questions that is raised, not only with this museum, but other member organizations of the Smithsonian, is the question of privately financed projects that require federal money to maintain them. Yeah, you see, most of the staff at the Smithsonian is, is now federally supported. And um, we had no success, as you can imagine, trying to get any money out of city government at this time. And um, because we were in New York, it was very difficult to get any money from federal government. And we have just been put in the Smithsonian budget as a line item. For how much money? Um, for, is this is for next year? No, it's for the, it, it was with the opening and uh, for a thirteen um, guards maintenance men. But only maintenance and guardianship. Yes, um, which amounts to about a oh, eight percent of our budget. So that the mm -hmm. remaining amount you have to go through your fundraising you have to raise. Well, you've certainly come up with a number of innovative schemes. In addition to running a museum, pro an ongoing museum, there are. Uh, at least the beginning of an extensive educational program. Can you tell us about that? Mm -hmm. We have classes here every night. Um, this semester we have classes for adults and for young children between the ages of 7 and 12, and in January we're going all the way down to 3-year-olds. What are you going to ask the 3-year-olds to do? Oh, that's the best age. <laughs> the, that's what it is. What will their classes Everybody be about? Everybody is a designer at that age. Hmm? What will those classes be directed Mostly to? visual perception. Well, you've studied art in all matter and form from calligraphy to drawing yourself, but you're not an art historian. How did you become a museum director? Well, I told you I was born in a museum. My father was an architect and my mother painted and I have somehow never known any other world. And uh, so I, I got all of my art history by going know. to museums all of my life. Hmm? How did uh, the Smithsonian come to know about this process of osmosis that was taking place with you? Well, I worked at the Corcoran in Washington in the 60s. Um, 60s, yes. Yes. And it was really one of the most exciting museums. The, the Smithsonian was a real sleeper then and about half the size, and they weren't doing anything in contemporary art at all. And I am. Um, did the educational programs at the Cochrane and started the first public programs at the Smithsonian, their first classes. I think you should describe those public programs because they were so significant and are now in the life of the Smithsonian, so you really have to go more than a glossed over phrase. Well, they have become the model, I think, for museum programs all over the country and, in fact, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, they had a 40,000 students, they told me, last year. But those and same Smithsonian Associates became the, uh, that, those same students became the basis of the Smithsonian Associates. Well, I also started that, but my school was always open to anyone. And, uh, How many the, the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Associates, Associates are there? the membership program of the Smithsonian, a million and a half. But I want to tell you that 
We sent out a membership brochure about a month ago, and our response was greater than the original response to the Smithsonian Associates 10 years ago. So how many members do you have here now? I, we, I didn't count after the first week, but there were over 2,000. And, and uh, the initial response to the Smithsonian, and can you imagine now it's a million and a half, is only 800. How far do you think the audience for this museum can be expanded? Well, I mean, we're too small to ever think in those terms. But we can plug into the Smithsonian in other ways, and we're very interested in, in doing educational program, uh, programs on another level. Uh, we have just signed an agreement with the Book of the Month Club to produce a series of home study courses. And we're working on the prototype right now. And when can we expect to see that? Next fall. We Let's hope. get back to the question of money, because in the end, it's what will make this museum possible. Who are the trustees of Cooper Hewitt? Oh, that's my biggest problem with money. My trustees are the regents of the Smithsonian, the vice president of the United States, the chief justice, <laughs> and uh, they don't make fundraising calls. <laughs> but I do have a small, um, well, several advisory groups. Uh, in fact, one basically in every area in which we have collection. We have an architecture one, and uh, Vince Scully at Yale is uh, the chairman of that, uh, an advertising one, uh, Lou Dorfman, who's head of uh, advertising at CBS, is head of that, and we have about, oh, 10 or 12. So you have a wide reservoir of resource persons, but who is your public? To whom do you gear this museum? We have many different publics. You see, because the collection is so very great, uh, it's, of, it's of special interest to scholars, it's of special interest to designers, uh, students of design, and um, now we're trying to make it you know, just simply popular to everyone. It's, it's the one thing that everybody does, whether he thinks about it or not. We're, we're all designers, and we all make design decisions all day long. How has the public responded to the show? There's been, uh, I guess, the whole range of agreement and disagreement among the critics, but ultimately it's the public who comes. How have they responded? We're packed. We don't know how to cope with the onslaught of people. It's very exciting. How many, what does that mean in terms of attendance? <laughs> well, I, I think it's about over, well, over 10,000 a week. And you're but you see, we're very small. That compares to about 40 a week. <laughs> Six years ago. 10,000 a week is an extraordinary number. Well, for a very side. small museum. I mean, it isn't for the Met, it isn't for the Smithsonian, it has a million and a half visitors a month. The Whitney plans on a thousand a week. I think that we have to reinvestigate that number. Oh, no, we, in two hours on a Sunday afternoon, had something that's over 3,000. And we've been having groups. Um, Excuse me, I meant a thousand a day, not a week. No, that's very small, a thousand a day. We have much more than that. I it think the first week again, we uh, a question that yeah. is one that is very much on the minds of both the uh, museum directors, but the public at large, and that is the whole question of the numbers in museums. How much pressure is brought to bear on any museum director to produce big numbers? I think a great deal. Um, it's the first thing anyone asks who's giving you money for, for an exhibition. How many people do you expect? So it was difficult for us with the first. Uh, we didn't want to give our attendance the last year. <laughs> but um, no, there are pressures. And, and how does that pressure affect what is ultimately shown here? I mean, it's again that age-old argument of box office versus scholarship. Well, I think you read that no one wants to do any architecture shows in this town, which is why we're doing the Palladio, because it isn't a big crowd drawer. Well, that Palladio show will be a big crowd drawer. It's, uh, I think, uh, open to the most uh, glowing notices uh, so far. Why don't we talk about some of your future shows? You've made reference to the Palladio. What does that mean, and when will it be here? In May, um, and it's, uh, I think you've read about the show recently, there are um, models of uh, Villas by Palladio. Our next show is going to be a very special show on the Royal Pavilion at Brighton. 
and we have the drawings for the interior of the pavilion. And uh, we're Do they belong to Cooper Hewitt? Mm -hmm. Is any of the show on loan from Brighton? Oh, well, we will show our own drawings, and we're borrowing 190 objects from Brighton and some special ones from the Queen of England, which Victoria took out of Brighton, and they're now in Buckingham and Windsor Castle. What kind of objects will you be borrowing, for oh, example? Uh, those um, lovely Brighton um, bamboo chairs that you might have seen that have, there's a great r revival of them now. Um, all kinds of decorative objects, dragons and... What's the major emphasis of your program this year? What do you want us to learn to absorb from this new presence in our midst? Uh, to, well, to be more conscious of design. And when do we get to see the permanent collection? Well, we have teasers all over New York. As you know, every museum in the city has participated in a celebration. And um, they're all showing objects from the collection. How did that come about? As someone said, we organized our own tribute. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I felt somehow we couldn't not open with some collection, and we really couldn't show it here. So I wrote to every museum director and said, will you show a few pieces? And, and they have. How did you make the move from downtown uptown? Same way. Called every other museum director and said, Will you borrow? And the custom, of course, in museums is if you borrow, you pick up at your own expense and you insure and you deliver at your own expense. So we're probably the only museum in history that ever moved for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were certain unborrowables, like office furniture, and we said to Cooper Union, Now we know you're renting space outside. What is it worth to you to get us out? three or four years early. What was it worth to them? It was worth moving the office furniture. <laughs> so. Your work has... You see, that's what you have to do when you're poor. <laughs> you don't know how wonderful it is for us to see people coming in the door and paying to get in. <laughs> and, um, no, that is rough. The attendance is about... Um, that is correct. It's about... But uh, we don't charge children, and we don't charge senior citizens. And uh, we're, we have a number of schools in the neighborhood. Spence is right across, uh, right next door. And we have a whole group of regulars who come every afternoon. Your work here has a, not only a national, but an international texture. Can you tell us what the relationship of Cooper Hewitt is to other museums in New York? to other museums in this country and to other museums in the world? Hmm. Well, our collection really touches on every collection in New York, and it's totally different. I mean, as the satellite shows will tell, uh, for instance, one would think we didn't have much in common with the Natural History Museum, but um, our satellite uh, exhibit over there is of rare natural history books in our collection, and. Um, some Chelsea plates with uh, botanical uh, subjects. Um, there, we're the only museum in the country devoted completely um, to historic and contemporary design, so in that sense, we're unique. Um, uh, as far as other countries are concerned, we're a combination because we collect both historic and contemporary. Say, what in France would be the Musée des Arts Décoratifs plus the new Center of Design, which is opening at Beauvoir in January. And in London, we would be a combination of both the Victoria and Albert Museum and the British Design Council and Reba and so on. How do you see your relationship to the very distinguished museum, uh, Center for Design uh, at the Museum of Modern Art? Well, I would hope that we might occasionally do things together. Um, well, how do you see your functions and, differing? And, um, you know, we might take a subject and they might handle contemporary and we would do old. Well, it's really, it's very different. Um, I think um, basically the design collection is rather small, about 3,000 objects, mostly of contemporary industrial design. And because they have that, we're not particularly interested in collecting it and we'll do our collecting of uh, industrial design primarily on film and uh, slide. 
but we don't really see any overlap at all. And, and you see, again, um, we cover 3,000 years. We're very, very interested in contemporary, but it's, you know, it's, it's very small. And we're also interested in many other kinds of design. Are there regional differences in taste in this country? I think so. Is the West Coast more eccentric? Well, <laughs> depends how you look at it. Well, how do you look at we, it? I lived in Washington and we always thought New Yorkers were. <laughs> well, is the Southern Rim more experimental? It, uh, the Southern is now. The no. Southern Rim, I mean. Well, let's carry it a bit further. I think it's uh, often one thinks of the West as being more eccentric, the Southern Rim more experimental, and the East more knowing. Would you agree or disagree with any of those premises? Neither. There are three of them, we said. <laughs> oh, the South somehow is there too, isn't it? Um, I don't know the South very well and can't judge the South, but as far as... How would you define well. the differences in taste in this country? How would I define it? On a regional well, I, basis. I think there's, uh, it, it's not so much the region, but the, whether the, your city folk or country folk has a lot to do with it too. Um, I mean, I don't think there's that much difference. I, I, uh, probably they're a little more flamboyant on the West Coast, but... Do um. you think there is a greater European influence on the East Coast, mm -hmm. other than San Francisco? Mm -hmm. <coughs> what city now is responsible for the best design? What city? Or state? Well, a lot of people say Chicago is. I've not been there. You think because of its tradition in terms of architecture as mm -hmm. well? But obviously it has to be New York. There are more buildings here. There may be more bad ones here, but there are also more good ones here. And internationally, is there any city that you consider more significant than others in terms of design? Well, I left Paris, <laughs> so I'm very prejudiced. And um, uh, most of the European cities that I find very beautiful are older cities. And in terms of contemporary design, do you think that Milan, for example, has a particular contribution? Well, I think as far as the newer things are concerned, we're all building the same thing everywhere. And no one's and, doing uh, it any better or more innovatively than elsewhere? Not particularly. And I think you can uh, see that in America, too. Uh, but it's hard to tell these days whether you're driving through Arkansas or Arizona because the, all of the chains, um, whether they're gas station or... or uh, food chains and uh, motels are very much the same, and I think uh, international architecture is, has that too. Your opening show was put together by 10 international designers. How did you decide, on what basis were they selected? Well, one was selected and he chose the others. It's hard enough to choose. So all of the choices were Hans mm -hmm. Holines. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some of the architects or designers involved and what they've done? Uh, one is a very interesting Japanese who worked uh, for years for um, Kenzo Tangi, and he's considered really the leading avant-garde architect of Japan. Uh, he did a very lovely room. And, and his name? Uh, didn't I mention? Uh, Arata Isisaki. I don't think it makes a difference whether I mentioned that. That's so difficult, no one will remember it. He took some of the um, bird cages in our collection and uh, showed them in his room. And uh, he picked that as a topic because I told him once that people used to refer to us as the Birdcage Museum. And um, you enter his room through a human cage, human-sized cage with a Fra Angelica angel in it. And um, then you see all of the cages on pedestals, but they're also caged by a piece of plexiglass as they have to be in a museum environment. And. Um, you see blue skies on the wall and then little photographs which are the bird's view from inside the cage. And of course it doesn't matter what the cage is made out of or when it was made, the view for the bird is the same. And uh, then you look at it very carefully and you see, well, um, is this really a view from a bird cage or looking out my window on the 12th floor in New York? So, you know, a lot of very subtle meaning. Then we have an Iranian group 
Is that going? Let's pause for a minute. Okay. there was an exposition in this country celebrating the centennial of the country. It was especially significant because it was the first time, as you know, that Americans saw that functional design could be aesthetically pleasing as well. And in many ways revolutionized the ways, the environment in which we live. Do you see any such almost revolutionary effect occurring in the most recent period? I'm not specifically referring to the bicentennial, but any other catalytic event that has changed the way we look at design and objects, our environment? I, I think it's changed a lot. Uh, when we first um, acquired this building, I could never bring an architect up here. I mean, we'd always have to meet in his office or in my house. And, Why? And, uh, oh, they said, you can never make a museum out of that building. And somehow, uh, the attitude has changed so much, and recycling is in, and we're right on target. And also, it's very funny, because uh, probably the most avant-garde kind of art you can have these days are things like this. So we're right on target when we start pulling them out. Why do you refer to that 18th century embroidery as avant-garde art? Well, I think it is. I mean, I, even our modern art museums are showing 19th century or, <laughs> art, so. We have a lot. We have about 3,000 years to back it up. Well, you've said often that design is everywhere. What do you envision design to be in the 21st century? Even more streamlined. Probably be able to throw everything away. Can you be specific uh, about any specific object or environment or dwelling or technological advancement that you are aware of? That I don't think I want to live then. <laughs> well, you are a long-range planner. What do you think design will be like in five or ten years from now? Will there be any dramatic changes? I think there is um, a difference, and, and it's funny, we, uh, for years, um, design or, or so-called good design has been stripped of all decoration, and uh, I think um, there's going to be a revival. To surface ornamentation? Mm -hmm. And just to, to pattern generally, you know, for years you could only buy a solid colored dress or, uh, or stripes or something. And we're back to flowers and um, all birds and all kinds of things. And, and so I think that's coming back. And uh, the surface ornamentation, which of course will reflect itself in buildings as well as paintings, what portends this new <coughs> direction? Well, what leads you to believe that? Oh, I think things go in cycles and nothing really in design is ever new. You know, that we just keep going on and... And what cycle are yeah. we in now? In a depressing cycle. <laughs> it's changing. <laughs> no, um, I, I'm very glad that we have a very great collection to show, to draw on, because I, a lot is rather uninteresting. But I think there's also for the first time a public concern about design and a concern on the part of the designer about other things such as appropriateness. And you see, not just judging a building in its own right, but judging a building in relation to its surrounding buildings. And um, for instance, that's why it was so important for us to preserve this house, because it preserves the whole community uh, that's named after this house. And we had a number of offers uh, from the developers. Carnegie Hill community yeah. is the name of the historic district that this uh, house is contained in. But uh, we had um, quite a few offers from developers 
to build condominiums here and to give us the first five floors or to build in the garden and my it was tempting. <laughs> do you have any innovative air rights or border schemes? <laughs> well, we do. We have very valuable air rights if anyone were building, but no one's building these days. You said for the years that you were trying to put this museum together that you'd hoped that it would change the way people would look at things. Do you think you've succeeded in that aspiration? Well, we're only open months. <laughs> Just come back and ask me in a year from now. I think uh, that we will have some. How has it changed your perception, your way of looking at things? Oh, I told you, I've seen stars everywhere. <laughs> yeah, but other than this one show, other than the show that you're obviously very caught up with at the moment, you've lived through this now for more than six years. And I assume that uh, you have refined and defined and redefined your own perception, your own value structure, as a result of being so immersed in this subject. In what ways has it changed your way of looking at things, your way of life? I've been too exhausted, actually, in recent weeks. I'm just so happy we made it. But I think uh, our thinking changes and, and is refined all along. How would you describe your own design philosophy? Well, I'm very flexible. What we don't want to do is say this museum believes this and we think this is good, therefore if you don't think this is good, you don't have any taste. Uh, we want to show many different styles. How do you and, define uh, to, quality? And to have this place be a forum, really. Well then how would you define quality or a standard within that resilient, flexible framework? Well, there's still a great range of quality of what? Um, you know, I think um, as far as <coughs> quality, um, a safety pin has quality. Wonderful design. You know, the test is that nobody's trying to design safety pins anymore. We have the ultimate, and it's good looking and it works, and um, you can't say that has quality if you compare it um, with a Porsche or something. You know, so um, you, you can't make broad statements like that, I think, that are valid in, as far as design is concerned. If you had it to do over again, what would you have done otherwise in terms of the museum and the show or any of your plans? Oh, I would have left immediately five <laughs> years ago. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, then it was too late. Then I, it was a question of pride. I had to do it, and there were so many people depending on me. Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it did? No, did you yours? <laughs> <laughs> no, well mostly in my day little girls didn't dream about growing up and being museum directors. And my daughter doesn't want to be, she thinks it's too hard. <laughs> but she's been a first-rate curator of this museum mm -hmm. ever since it's opened. She's taken visitors around and demonstrated all kinds of things. Um, Tell us about some of the shows that you have planned and some of the, you know, the ancillary programs for the museum. Uh, we have developed one series of um, exhibitions called Immovable Objects. Uh, and we did the first experimental one about a year and a half ago on a shoestring. And that was to have people look at architecture in its natural surroundings, not, not in a museum. Um, through drawings, which very few people understand, or through models, which are the wrong scale and really don't give the feeling of it. And we put Lower Manhattan on exhibit. And we actually put labels on buildings and then had a number of exhibitions within the exhibit. One was on the building of a skyscraper, which was held in the lobby of the Woolworth building. And then two other exhibits analyzed two blocks. Why? one had changed so drastically and why one had remained the same. And um, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, difficult to get started because we would call certain people and say, would you, try, would you clean your building? We'd like to put it on exhibit. And they thought we were mad. But um, it was a very successful show in the sense that many, many people who would never come to a museum saw it. 
and uh, it's being copied in cities all over the world. And uh, we would like to do a whole series of those. We're in the process of working on one on subways, analyzing. What will you do with subways? <laughs> Well, you see, what we want to do is change the public attitudes towards subways. I mean, they don't have to look as awful as they do. And we're the ones who make them look that awful. So what we wanted to do was to analyze 12 systems, um, Moscow, Paris, uh, Toronto, um, Mexico City, um, and so on. And. Um, so far, that will would adopt a subway yeah, idea. That will be in a subway, in subway stations in New York, and uh, we will publish a newspaper instead of a catalog, as we did with the other one, because you see, you re reach a much wider audience. And uh, actually, we may be doing something with a subway station, too. Um, For example? Well, possibly redesigning one. And um, then. Um, Oh, in that vein, we're doing one on parks, playgrounds, and plazas. And what we would like to do is leave something behind and leave a new park behind. And then one will be on the concept of Main Street and Broadway as New York's Main Street, and um, exhibits all along, uh, in storefronts all along Broadway. And then the whole show um, in Albany where Broadway ends. We've talked to a number of museum directors now, and more and more they tell us that in order to survive, they have to beg, as you have, borrow, trade. How much of their time is spent in what are generally considered non-museum director activities? In terms of the future direction of museums, do you think that a museum director should be an art historian or an administrator? Probably an administrator. You couldn't. Um run a museum and um, do your own research. I mean, I'm sure that's true of every museum director in this town or any large museum. They've also talked about the future direction of museums themselves. Some obviously all see the function of museums to conserve and preserve. Yet, do you think, what do you think the future role of a museum will be? I, I think um, more of an educational role than it's been. And in terms of your museum, how will that manifest itself? Well, I did mention briefly the um, home study courses we were planning to do. We would also like to do programs on television cassettes. We're already uh, producing slide kits. We, while we've been closed, we've been photographing everything that we've had on the premises, and we have made Oh, and over 40,000 slides. So that is available? Mm -hmm. At cost to all Actually, schools. there are a number of uh, professions money. that use one section of this museum as a fundamental resource. Mm -hmm. Architects uh, and designers, uh, isn't that so? Mm -hmm. And a lot of fabric designers of fabric, of wallpaper. And um, we're getting involved in some of that also just to keep alive. Uh, is this merchandising? Well, you see, them? what happened is people always used to use our collections and uh, change them slightly. Um, what are you by entering an arrangement now? with them, we have the opportunity to supervise and uh, to see that it's well done and we get a 5% royalty. In terms of going in that direction, are you planning on packaging and marketing any of your things yourself? For example, the way the Metropolitan does? Well, on a much, much smaller scale. We don't have the money to invest in it, but we are already starting a collector's club. And what does that members, mean? Um, to, to reproduce or commission new works in limited edition. Have you started to commission any yet? No, but it, it, we're narrowing down some first choices. Is this ceramic, silver? Anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 You're just thinking of some of the things we might reproduce. Well, I keep on picturing Mondrian bed sheets at the Museum of Modern Art, so I mm. cannot imagine what you're going to be doing now, here. Well, listen, I should tell you the wonderful, um, no, uh, the um, sheets by contemporary designers are wonderful things to collect. I buy them and, and uh, put them in my daughter's hope chest. 
And you see it in, when she gets married in 20 years from now, she'll be the only one with a Cecil Beaton sheet or bill And the only one with a non-throwaway sheet in terms of what you said earlier, too. <laughs> one of the questions we've been asking each of our guests is a less than fair one, but it has not uh, stopped me from asking it. And that is, regardless of price or availability, what object would you like to be surrounded by, to have for yourself or for this museum? What one object? You don't have to limit yourself to one. We know what a great well, collector you, you know. are. No, we're <laughs> interested in process, not just in objects, so that's an unfair question to ask me. Now, one of the things this museum wants very much to do which will be reflected in its exhibitions is, is to study the whole process of design or how things look the way they do, why they function, and not just emphasize only the end product. What is your favorite period? <coughs> well, uh, probably 18th century. <laughs> and is it uh, furniture? Is it porcelain? Is it embroidery? Well, I'm a collector of anything that's smaller than a bread box. <laughs> and what do you include in that collection? Oh, well, I like things that are containers, basically, boxes or perfume bottles or just bibelot, but also antique picture frames, combs, just small things. And that's because um, I do think your environment is very important and, and uh, when I married my husband and, and moved to New York, he was already established in an apartment. And I felt very uncomfortable there, not having any of my own furniture around me. And then I started to bring up my little things, and there are more of my little things there are than there are of his big things, and it's very much my apartment. What is the central focus of that collection? Is it the 18th century? It's really anything I like. You know, and some are very fine, and others are simply little paper boxes, and some are new, and some are very old. So it, um... One of the topics that have been speculated upon for the last several weeks, and is obviously a topic for speculation and concern and interest for each of us, is the fact that a new administration, political administration, will occur in a very short while. What do you think a democratic administration means for the arts? Oh, I think it will be very much the same. Um, I think it would be a bad policy not to support the arts. And I think each year the uh, federal allocations will increase, and it won't matter what administration. You're saying that the one thing that now is beyond partisan dispute mm -hmm. is the arts. And so that I assume what, all, what else you're saying is that suddenly there is a constituency out there that makes themselves known to whomever is the office holder. Yes. What leads you to that conclusion, uh, Lisa? Well, it's, um, no, it is a popular thing. Uh, it, there is a problem, though, for the National Endowment, which has to distribute money nationally. And I <laughs> served on the museum panel for three years and know is that most of the requests come from New York and from California and, and Boston and just really about four or five states. Isn't and that a central to, question that will have to be faced? Mm -hmm. Do we decentralize this money or do we send it to the primary, so to speak, institutions? Well, you see, they've tried to do that in the part of the National Endowment <laughs> budget goes to state arts councils to begin with. So in that sense, it does get out across the country. But then other things um, really are, we liked in our panel to judge things by quality, but always keeping in mind, um, you know, that, that we can't You're give right it all right. away in New York. But if you did do that, um, I think the arts would suffer. Is there consideration given to the fact that major urban centers often have the largest museums, but ultimately share what they have by circulating those exhibitions throughout the country? Yes, and a lot is done uh, by the endowment to encourage working together. Uh, they're setting up uh, regional conservation centers all over. 
Are you planning to set up regional centers or well, this museum? We're setting up conservation centers, but our collection is so large and in such bad repair that it'll be about 10 years before we'll be able to take in other work. But then we want to, we, what we would like to do as soon as we have set them up is to take apprentices. Well, special thanks for taking us in tonight. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein talking with Lisa Taylor at New York's Cooper Hewitt Museum, the National Museum of Design. Thank you very much for having yeah. us. I hope you all come specific um, plans to take either of those shows. Please, there is um, one person talking at a time, and right now it is Mrs. Taylor. Excuse me, please. The Centennial show is too large, and um, we have a special opening year festival, and by the time, um, well, actually also the Venturi show wouldn't work very well in this building. I did go down and see it. and um, The one at the Renwick? Mm -hmm. Sir. But, uh, you know, we lend back and forth very freely, and we have sent many of our collections down there. For instance, we had uh, a large costume collection. We didn't want to compete with the Costume Institute six blocks away, so, you know, we sent them there on loan. Uh, how much money does the museum have for acquisitions, and how are new acquisitions obtained? Well, most, uh, we have a, uh, an acquisition fund of about a quarter of a million um, dollars. <laughs> Which uh, I had to freeze until I was sure that uh, we would have a museum, and so I have, we've just started to unfreeze it. And have you made course, any purchases since you've opened? No. We've all been too busy. But, um, we have been offered so much. Just since we've been up here, uh, we have been offered, or not have been offered, because we turned down most things were offered, but we have accepted seven, over 71,000 objects. Since, for, since when? Well, since in about four years. But you see, I mean, an object can be a small place. How does one count uh, table service? Is it by we the object or one, one unit? Count. We count it as one. That's why we have no way of really estimating the size of our collection. Because a, a, a set of silver would be acquisitioned as one. You had said that you felt that someone who's experienced in administration um, usually would work as a director. Or, do you have an art history background? Or have you, have you worked well, no, I've studied history. And then what I was really more interested in was using my hands and uh, then went on, um, to, I studied uh, Chinese history because I studied Chinese language uh, and all kinds of things that are totally unrelated to the job of a museum director. Well, you were a yeah. ceramicist and that relates mm -hmm. to your job here. Are there other questions? Are there slide kits available to the public schools? Are there slide kits available? Are there slide yes. kits available we to public to, schools or teachers? Was well, the you see, what we are doing is we're just starting to reproduce the first ones, and I think we've made about eight of them. Is there someone who hasn't asked a question yet? Someone in the back, I had the gentleman in the back, Lawrence. At various times in the history of design, one medium or another seems to be a predominant medium, and in other mediums, you will notice that there's a lot of derivative work do you see today any one medium or, or one particular medium, medium that is influencing another one as you look at the world of design? Well, I think uh, synthetics in general. Uh, you know, everything is changing. It's very hard even to buy uh, cotton sheets or, or linen sheets. They're completely impossible or curtains. Just certain things are disappearing because as the other things are more practical. Perhaps I use the wrong term. I'm thinking more of the fact that it... Whether you mean wood or... Hmm? Uh, well, yeah. Sometimes we'll notice that, that architecture seems to have a great, very great effect upon small jewelry that's made. Or that does have history. Uh, you might find that, that 
Well, I think we're going through a very funny period right now, uh, which started um, with the energy crisis. So all of the old values went down the drain because contemporary design basically was based on maximum use of energy. And so we've had to reevaluate. And it's why everyone is confused. And it's why, for instance, you would find um, a Beaux-Arts show at um, MoMA, which would have been unheard of you know, five years ago because so you're saying mm -hmm. that's a, we are in a period of reevaluation, mm -hmm. and that obviously is why that mm -hmm. show occurred too. Mm -hmm. There was another question. Right yes, I have a, a question about the announcement today of the uh, education and communication center that's being set up at the Metropolitan. Uh, what effect you see this having? Oh, I think that's going to be wonderful. You know, we should have more. Um, the Smithsonian is doing a similar thing. Who's paying for it with the Smithsonian? Private. So, has that been announced yet? And what do they plan to do? Well, to produce um, from their yeah. series. Archive. You see, they have that. Uh, but that won't relate only to art history. It'll be no. the whole you see, range. Uh, art would be very minor as far as the Smithsonian is concerned. It would be uh, oh, history, technology, air and space, natural history. Uh, but that really may be the advent of uh, this promised wired revolution that we've been hearing about for 10 or 12 years when that kind of money gets behind uh, institutions that may are museums, but akin to university centers mm -hmm. in terms of just the reservoir of data and materials and objects. It's quite extraordinary uh, what it portends and how that can be disseminated. But you see, we will all benefit from that. The more people are interested in art, the more they come, uh, would go to any museum. And the more you will, you here on you know a smaller scale yes. will get money as well. There'll be a much greater demand. It says that I couldn't be more pleased. Yes. What, um, speaking on that subject, um, there are more people who are obviously white middle class who are interested in it. What attempts is your museum making to bring in minority views, certain minority views on design and? Uh, um, uh, well, uh, we have had no control over who comes, and we haven't, you know, we were surprised that so many people have been coming, so we haven't been out looking for people. But you will plan an uh, outreach program. Yes, and in fact, we are doing a show, uh, again, as part of the Movable Immovable Object series um, on ethnic communities and their contributions to design. Some have been very small, and others have been quite major. Which ethnic community has oh. had a significant... Uh, well, I mean, just, uh, we're not measuring whether you, this one has contributed more than that one, but uh, to try to document the various contributions. The gentleman in... And um, the also, we will be offering scholarships. I was fascinated by your downtown architectural show, your immovable objects show. Are you planning to have more of them, and how do you see the role of the museum as an exponent of, as a, as a museum of architecture. But we are, modern as well as. We are planning to do a whole series, and we learned a lot from doing that. Uh, first of all, all of our labels were stolen. <laughs> and what uh, people would take them as souvenirs, or, or very often the owner of the building would say, yes, of course, we're delighted to have you put our building on exhibit, and then he wouldn't tell the cleaning man. He would think we had defaced his building and ripped it off. And, um, but also very large banners. A nine-foot banner disappeared during the night. And uh, so that we, during the past year, I've had people working on how we might do this uh, and have it survive vandalism, which is the biggest problem, really. But now we have a whole series, and they will be done as quickly as they're funded. Is there a last question from someone who hasn't asked one? Are there any further questions? What kind of wood is this? Oh, 
joke. Actually, mm -hmm. this is one of the outstanding architectural details, mm -hmm. isn't it? This oak coffered ceiling. Mm -hmm. And it was oak of the period. It was not old um, oak. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us a little bit more about <coughs> the evening classes? You mentioned adults and children and stuff like that. Perhaps a little bit more description. Uh, well, uh, we have about... We have five, ten, uh, five semesters a year. A fall, a winter one which begins in January, spring one in um, April through June, and then two summer sessions. And we have about, oh, we will have at least 10 or 12 courses each semester. At the moment we have one on Art Nouveau, on the English Country House, American Decorative Arts. Um, what else? Oh, silver, uh, theater design, costume. Um, actually, there is a way for you to receive that information because obviously the museum not only wants you to come, but to come off and to whom do they write or call for I that? think there may be a few. On the, I noticed there were things there. on the table in the rear right. <coughs> if not, I think if you call the museum, there is a department that really uh, deals with that in great detail, and I know they're eager to have you. Or, or uh, the address is 90, so a postcard will do. Thank you again, Lisa Taylor, for having us. Thank you for coming. <laughs> See you next week for last time. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't see you. It would be very well with the light.